Part 1. You will hear two people discussing an extramural course. Fill in the information you hear on the application form below. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now, here is the conversation. Hi, Jenny. What are you doing down here? Oh, hello, Steve. Well, I'm trying to fill in this form, but I'm having a bit of a struggle as I sprained my wrist playing tennis yesterday. Don't worry. I'll do it for you. Let's have your pen. Right, fire away. Mm, let's see. I want to do the drama and theatre studies. I'd like to get the certificate. The course number is uh, 60201. No, sorry, 202. It seems to be on Thursday at 7.30. Yes, well, we don't have to put all that down. Now, I suppose we can call you Miss. Don't be funny. And spell my name right. Hmm. Well, if you'll have a name like Jenny McPherson... Let's see. It's M-A-C. No. Big M, small c, no A. Right. M-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N. Yes, OK. And don't forget it's a capital P, Macpherson. Now, what's your address? Well, I've just moved, so it's 6 Westway Avenue, Longford. Hang on, don't go so fast. 6 Westway Avenue, where? Longford. What's next? Your phone number, daytime and evening. Well, I've only got one, as we can't have calls at school in the daytime, so put down the evening one. 605-4829. 4829, OK. And you're a teacher. How old are you? 29? Mmm, wish I were. No. 32. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do they want my date of birth? No, don't seem to. Just age. Uh, how about educational qualifications? Well, I've got a degree in English literature and a diploma in media studies. Media studies, right. Now, have you ever done any of these extramural courses before? No, don't think so although I did do something on psychodrama once. But no, it wasn't extramural, was it? That seems to be it, except for the fee. Yes, well, that's the same for all the central courses. I think £25. I suppose I have to include it with this form. <laughs> Looks like it. Uh, do you want me to write the cheque out for you? But uh, you'll have to sign it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between two flatmates, Craig and Don, 
who are looking for a third person to share their flat. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi Craig, been home long? Yeah, quite a time. Did anyone phone about renting the spare room? Yeah, we've had three phone calls about it. Really? Yeah. Do you want to hear about them? Sure. Right. The first one was called Phil Parrott. Uh-huh. He's a teacher. He's just qualified and he teaches sports. OK. Actually, I'm not sure about him. He certainly sounded energetic, but he asked lots of questions about whether we smoked and what sort of food we cooked. Yeah. I mean, we don't exactly live on pizza and chips and takeaways. Well, not quite, but... But he might be a bit too health conscious to really fit in with the sort of life we lead. Yeah. And he asked a lot of questions about the room... He said he needs a big room because he's got lots of sports equipment. Well, th that's OK. The room's quite big, but I'm not so sure about him. What about the second one? He was called David Spencer. Spender? No, Spencer. C-E-R. He works at Cooper Long. You know, the big company on Broad Street. He said he was a lawyer. Oh. I'd have thought in that case he'd be earning enough to rent his own place. I wonder why he wants to share a flat. Well, he didn't say. He's quite a bit older than us. He did say he's just moved down here from the north of England. He seemed very quiet, actually. Maybe he wants to meet some new people. I got the impression he was a hard-working kind of person who doesn't go out all that much. Right. But he sounded OK. Oh, one thing, though. He said he wouldn't be staying in the flat at the weekends so he wants to pay reduced costs for gas and electricity because he's only here five days out of seven. Oh, I'm not sure about that. What do you think? Well, I suppose it's fair, but it all sounds a bit complicated. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Anyway, there was a third person, Leo Norris. Yes. He's an engineer. Oh, yeah. And he's about our age. Right. What did he sound like? Well, actually, he was really funny. I couldn't stop laughing when I was talking to him. He said he was very lazy and never got up until noon at weekends. And I said that wouldn't be a problem here. <laughs> no, certainly not. But actually, I suspect he was joking when he said he was lazy. I think he lives life as it comes. He's certainly not competitive or stressed, but he likes cycling and things like that. He sounds like an outdoor type. Anyway, I thought he sounded as if he'd fit in. He wanted to check if there was somewhere safe for his bicycle. That's not a problem. No, he can leave it in the garage with my car. So did you get his contact details? Yes, he left his mobile number. It's 0777 687 2433. And does he want to move in straight away? Well, he's paid his rent in his present place up to the 31st of September, but he said that if possible he'd like to move in a bit before then. He said the 28th of September. And he was OK about the rent? Yeah. He said it was fine. Right. 
So shall we give him a ring and see if he wants to come round and... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Listen to somebody giving a talk about how setting goals can help you achieve more. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see that so many people managed to make it. An achievement in itself when I'm sure you're all so busy. This evening, I'm going to talk with you about setting goals and how setting goals can help you understand what you really want to achieve. First, though, I'd like to start by saying what I think achievement actually means. I think some people think it's simply about being successful in a job or making money, but it certainly doesn't have to mean that. Achievement is simply accomplishing goals that you set for yourself, doing what you plan to do, and people might plan to do all sorts of different things. Achievement is about realising your dreams. I would also like to say that to achieve, you must have belief. Belief that you can do whatever it is you want to do. There is more to achievement than simply wanting to do something. Anyone can say that they want something, but actually getting it is not so easy. To get it, you must believe that it is yours. Not having belief is the main reason that so many people do not achieve. If you really want something, you must talk and act like you already have it. Then you have belief and then you will achieve. So, goal setting. Goal setting is about imagining the future and then turning the dream into a reality. Setting goals helps you to be clear about what you really want and helps you concentrate on getting what you want. Setting goals will help you see what is stopping you from knowing what's important. And because achieving goals makes you feel good, you will be more confident and succeed more easily. Goal setting is something that all achievers do, whether they are high flyers in business or successful athletes. It is important that you set both long-term and short-term goals. First, you need to have an idea of what you want from life. I call this the big picture. Then you break this down into a number of smaller goals that you need to achieve in order to achieve the overall goal. As I say, the first step is to see the big picture. Think about what you want in the next 15 or 20 years. Doing this will influence all the smaller goals that you set yourself. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. You need to think carefully about different areas of your life and how they influence each other. You should identify the important areas of your life and try to set goals in each of those areas. Here are the areas that most people want to focus on. But remember that everyone is different. First, think about your career. How important is your career to you? Do you want to be a manager or run your own business? Or are you happy working for other people? Connected to this is the financial side of your life. What sort of income do you want to have? Is wealth important to you? You need to think about long-term relationships. At what age do you hope to be married? Do you want to have children? How much time do you want to spend with the people you love? You need to think about your health and how that could change what you can achieve. How will you stay healthy as you get older? Do you do anything that is not good for your health? And how will you try to do those things less or stop doing them completely? Finally, you need to think about your free time, your hobbies and interests. How much time do you want to have to do what you really enjoy? It is difficult to achieve goals in one area if you feel that you don't have the time to do the things that really make you happy. Now, when you have this overall picture, try to set yourself one goal for each area. Make sure the goals are what you really want and not what you think other people want from you. Of course, in life, it is important to make the people around you happy, but you must focus on what you want. Now, I will go on to talk about how to break your lifetime plan down into short-term goals. But first, does anyone have any questions about what I've said so far? The end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on art history. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the last lectures, we looked at the art of the ancient Egyptians and then considered the art of other ancient Mediterranean civilizations, in particular Greece and Rome. We're now going to return to Egypt to consider a set of very unusual pictures known as the Fayum portraits. The Fayum is a lush green area about 100 kilometers west of Cairo. Following the conquest of Egypt by the Greek warrior Alexander the Great in 332 BC, large numbers of businessmen and officials who had come over from Greece settled in this fertile region with their families. They gradually adopted some features of Egyptian culture, including the practice of mummification, embalming the bodies of their dead and wrapping them in linen bandages in order to preserve them as mummies. The name actually comes from an Arabic word meaning an embalmed body. These newcomers made one distinctive innovation, though. After binding the mummy, they laid over the face a picture representing the person inside. 
The portraits look like oil on canvas, but they were actually produced using a technique called encaustic, where the artist applies pigmented wax to a wooden board with a small spatula. The Egyptologist William Petrie, who discovered many of these mummies with their accompanying portraits at the end of the 19th century, was convinced that they were actually done in the lifetime of the subject, rather than being painted after the person's death, as had been the case with older Egyptian paintings. He felt they were very different from the traditional stylized images that had been used on Egyptian mummy casings in previous centuries, and was convinced that they were actually portraits giving a realistic depiction of the person. He pointed out that the boards on which they were painted showed signs of having been cut down to size to fit within the mummy bandages. To him, this suggested that they may have originally been larger and been hung in the houses of the owners during their lifetimes. But more than a century after they came to light, nobody knew how far they were really depictions of real people, as against idealized portraits. Then a team from Manchester University decided to find out by recreating the faces of Fayoum mummies in clay and then comparing the reconstructions with the portraits. The team was provided with skulls from two Fayoum mummies from the British Museum and given the information, based on x-rays and other evidence, that one of the mummies was of a 50-year-old man and the other was a woman in her early twenties. Armed only with this information, they set to work. First, they created copies of the skulls. Then they used clay to build up the facial muscles in order to reconstruct what the person looked like. After weeks of painstaking labor, two faces emerged. Only then were the two portraits revealed so that the match between the reconstructions and the portraits could be examined. In the case of the man, both model and portrait showed a broad, flat face with a slightly hooked nose and a fleshy mouth with broad lips. But the man in the portrait was noticeable for his five o'clock shadow, the beard beginning to grow around his chin and on his cheeks. This would have been quite a recognizable feature of the man in real life, and an easy thing for the painter to copy. However, it wasn't something that the makers of the model could know about. In the reconstruction, the right eye was slightly higher than the left, and this was the same on the portrait. But on the portrait, the eyes were very large, which is standard with many of the Fayoum portraits, while in the model they were longer and narrower. The portrait of the woman appeared to be even more of a standard type, with her large eyes, straight nose and small mouth. These pretty feminine features suggested this could be an idealized woman's face, and yet it proved to match the reconstruction surprisingly closely. The proportions of the lower face corresponded, and so did those of the forehead, though in the portrait the eyes were closer together and larger than in the reconstruction. And in both cases the head was set on a solid neck, suggesting a more powerful physique than you might have expected from these delicate features. So, overall, the similarities between the portraits and the models are too close to be accidental. The artists may have started from a standard picture, but attempts were made to modify this to reflect the characteristics of the subject, what gave the face its personal qualities. Obviously, this isn't much of a sample upon which to judge an entire genre of portraiture, but the researchers are convinced that on the whole, the artists aimed to represent their subjects as they appeared in real life, whether this was flattering to them or not. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.